Have you been struggling when it comes to encounter building with Starfinder? Today we're going to talk a little bit about what Paizo suggests that you do. I'm going to tell you what I do, and then we'll maybe solicit the crowd and see what you do. Today we're talking about encounter building. Hello everyone, welcome to the Maple Table. My name's Nathaniel. This is a channel where we discuss lore around some of your favorite games such as Starfinder, Werewolf the Apocalypse, if that's something you're interested in, I would love to have you join me at the table, and you can do so by hitting that subscribe button or joining the Discord server. When it comes to designing encounters, you want to make them fun, you want to make them engaging, and you want to make them a bit of a challenge for your players, but it can't also kill them. Unless you're one of those GMs that really likes to have player versus GM. I don't feel this is healthy, but hey, they exist. To understand how the encounter system works and what you should be looking at when it comes to designing your encounters for Starfinder, we have to get involved with a little bit of math. I promise it will be easy and you can follow along with me. The first thing we need to find out is what is your average party level? And the core rulebook refers to this as the APL. If you're following along with the book with me, we're gonna be starting at page 388. Let's apply what we know to a fake gaming group, and I'm going to use some simple math for the purposes of this. Let's say that you have four players at your table, each of their characters is level four, your average party level is then four. If you don't know how to find this, add the character level of each individual player at your table, and then divide it by the number of players that you have at your table. If you're one of those GMs who isn't keeping the player levels consistent across the board and you have a fractional number, round it down to the nearest whole number. The book will actually tell you to round to the nearest whole number. I find that rounding down makes your encounters maybe a little bit on the easier side, so if you're unsure, it gives you that extra little bit of cushion. The next step in the Paizo system is to find out how difficult do you want this encounter to be and you can use this little chart to help you figure that out. Now we need to match up a creature that you want to throw at your players with a CR that closely resembles whatever your player's average party level is. If you only throw one creature at your players, but it's a strong one, you have problems with the action economy scales. The creature that you've thrown at them, although there's only one of them and it is very strong, it may be able to attack only once, maybe twice, depending on what you've thrown at them, and your players, if there's four of them, are going to get to act four times. On the flip side of that, if you put too many creatures for them to fight, then they're going to get to go way more often and hit and do potentially way more damage to your players than they get to act. This is where it starts to get into a little bit more art than science, although they're trying to give you a formula. It's okay. Now with the final step in this process, you now know what challenge rating you want to give your players when it comes to this encounter. So this will now give you a pool of experience that you can then use to buy monsters. Paizo recommends not going above the encounter experience pool. If you start to go above this, you start messing with some of the mechanics of the system, but again, this is where it becomes art more than science. Now there are also things you can spend this experience pool on, and it's not just specifically monsters. You can buy traps, hazards, even just throw in a few extra smaller creatures if you've got one big one. And then when it comes to rewarding the players the experience after they have accomplished or beaten your encounter, they do give some suggestions on the experience that you should award to each player, depending on how many there are in your group. Pretty simple, right? Well, we're not quite done just yet, because what happens after you have beaten an encounter, you have slain those bandits, or you have taken down a radioactive dragon? You need to find that sweet, sweet loot. Shiggity shwooty, I'm coming for that booty. In this, Paizo also has given us a graph or a spreadsheet that we can look at as to what you should be getting from each encounter. Keep in mind this isn't related to strictly money. This is related to cash, but also related to the value of the items that you are giving your players. And I'll just throw this out there as well. If you have those players that are very interested in picking up every single thing that they find, grabby hands and pickpockets, anything that is 
collected out in the world, you can only resell back for 10% of its value. That is the process that Paizo is suggesting that you go through and they have given you the tools and the graphs to show you the information that you need to design whatever you want. Now, what I do is a slight variation of this. It is more reflective of my ADHD and wanting it to happen fast and not sit down and bookkeep and do all of this tracking. If you're like me, you can use this method, absolutely. But if it goes sideways on you, be prepared with an out or some way to rescue your players. Your players could just be rolling like crap all night and you need to now step in because luck hates them. For myself, I do use the encounter difficulty chart as a gauge of what I want the encounter to be like. I also use the CR equivalencies chart to get a feel for how many creatures to be throwing at my players. Beyond that though, I really don't use the experience pool. I am very much aware of how much experience each monster gives, but I'm, uh, I'm a little more liberal, I guess, when it comes to the experience points. One example that I'll use for my thought process around this is coming from my own game with my own players. They had all been introduced to each other, gotten to know each other a little bit, and the characters were at level two. I advance everybody together because I just like to keep the math simple. So the characters that were in my group, you have Flick, the android technomancer. You have Thrain, the Vlaka Vanguard. I had Boomer, the Yasoki operative, who's... Well, he likes explosives. And then I also had Dr. Bear, an uplifted bear who is a biohacker. Everybody's level is level two. That means my average party level is two. I wanted them to have a challenging encounter. So that is average party level plus one, which is three. The creature that they encountered was the Akata. I love them. <laughs> the Akata. I, I love my players too, but I also love the Akata. In reviewing this, I realized that I made that, that particular fight a little bit stronger than I originally anticipated because the value of this goes two CR1 creatures is two, but there's two of them, so that's plus two, which means total of four, which would have made that encounter a hard encounter, not a challenging encounter. So yay learning as a GM. It doesn't matter anyways, because at lower levels, you have way more wiggle room and they steamrolled they steamrolled the creatures. What you'll need to be able to do though throughout this process is if you have a player who drops out for life, if you have someone who drops out, depending on how you run your game, whether they're just not there or you let somebody else take over their character sheet, then you don't have to do that much adjustments. If you are like me and they are just not there, you do need to be able to tone down your encounter just a little bit. As like many things with my own personal GM style, I am quite loose with the rules. I am quite loose when it comes to building the encounters. Tell me in the comments below, how do you handle this? Are you one of those GMs who likes to stick exactly with what is written? Or are you someone who is a little bit more loose with how they handle things like myself? No matter where you fall in terms of how you plan for your sessions, it is always, always important to have at least a little bit of time, a few minutes if you're already familiar with how the tables work, so that you have the time to figure out what's going to happen or what you can do with your players. Now there's also a bunch of things that we didn't talk about when it comes to encounter building today, and that's how to build some engaging encounters, different mechanics that you can throw into your encounters. I would like to do some more videos around encounter building and how to do this more effectively or maybe more engaging. And although the game does present the experience pool system for building your encounters, there is another way that you can build them without having to do all the experience tracking if you want to do something different. And I will have a different video around this another time. If you are one of the folks who has supported me through Patreon, I salute you. Autumn Alchemist, Orbs McMellons, RRSPQ, Ducky, Vox, Cane Root, War Pony, Get of Math Rocks, BA Bravo, Arutvin, the First Layer, Bones Malone, Westheimer, and Ain't No Waifu. If you would like to get your name on that list, then please consider supporting me through Patreon. Link is in the description. If you would like to learn more about running the game of Starfinder, I have a video on the screen for you now. YouTube will have also made a recommendation for you there as well. My name's Nathaniel. 
This has been The Maple Table. Thanks for stopping by, everyone.